This is Going Underground. I'm Afshin Ratansi. Coming up on the show... Britain is not going to get involved in another war in Iraq. We're not going to be putting boots on the ground. Really, Mr Cameron? Boots are on the ground in Iraq once again. But is it NATO ally Turkey that we are at war with? And where does Britain's future lie as party politics falls apart? Plus, are British laws being created over canapes at the Tory Winter Ball? All this and more coming up on today's Going Underground. Now we're back at war in Iraq, it's all too easy to forget that we're still at war in Afghanistan, just weeks after Britain unveiled its watchkeeper drone developed with the Israelis to aid U.S. attacks, NATO claimed some victorious assassination strikes. But Afghan officials immediately disputed NATO accounts of what happened. The local villagers claimed that they were collecting firewood on a mountainside when they were hit by the airstrike. As you can see, there are children among the dead bodies. Wedding parties, impoverished people collecting firewood. This is all not an episode of Channel 4's Israeli TV series, Homeland. This is the war that continues to be hidden by our mainstream media. Turkey has restarted its war on the Kurds, who the RAF is now helping. Ankara even denied claims from Washington that it had given President Obama permission to help the Kurds against ISIS. After the UN envoy to Syria warned of a massacre in Kobani, anyone would think NATO countries were at war with one of their own, Turkey. British boots are even on the ground in Iraq, in effect, fighting Turkey. With me is the Iraqi president of the Arab Lawyers Association, Sabah al Mukhtar. Welcome, Sabah, to Going Underground. So why isn't Turkey helping the British and American war effort against ISIS? Well, one would have to understand the issue from a Turkish perspective. Turkish perspective is that, first of all, they don't want to have a fight with ISIS. It's a threat, but they don't want to have a fight. This is number one. Number two, what Turkey is being asked to do is to assist the West to fight ISIS, but not to deal with the issue in Syria. Even when we talk about the, the British soldiers, British soldiers are really trying to, so to speak, assist the Kurdish fighting force. Is it Kobani only we are talking about, or other areas? The U.S. has, has a free hand to operate in Iraq. It does not have a free hand to operate in Syria. Interesting what relief that puts Article 5 of the NATO Constitution into, because aren't, isn't David Cameron saying it's an existential threat here, which means that we're allowed to fight there, and Turkey's an ally, so Turkey should support Britain? Well, this is another issue where, where the problem is. In the West, we tend to think that the biggest problem there is ISIS. The people there in Syria and in Iraq... They don't actually see it that way. ISIS is actually making them pay the price. The people who are suffering from ISIS are the Iraqis and the Syrians, not the British, the French or the Americans. Nevertheless, they think that their problem is Baghdad and Damascus. And the West does not want to deal with this, although they want to deal with Syria, but they don't want to deal with Baghdad. And when it comes to Syria, the U.S. have no mandate to do it. It doesn't have the legal ground to do it, even if they get the injuric base. So a good point you make there. So the people in the Middle East are people as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that, that'll come as a surprise to our foreign office, perhaps. But um, what about the fact that, the, uh, that uh, Mr. Erdogan can even refuse UN calls to open the Turkish border? We know, I mean, give us a bit of this perspective over tens of thousands have died in the Kurdish wars. Well, the, the, the Kobani is now being fought not by ISIS as we want to see it, it's ISIS, which is separate. It's actually Kurdish forces within ISIS fighting the Kurdish forces, which are PKK in Kabani. We have Mrs. Hero Talabani, that's the wife of the ex-Iraqi president, who is working with the Iranians. They are working with PKK. They are getting this issue into it. They are trying to apply pressure within Turkey, uh, demonstrations and what have you. Turkey has a, has a, has a very delicate situation with the Kurdish problem. David Cameron, the Americans, the Australians, the Canadians, they don't have a problem with the Kurds. They don't have a problem with the yeah, PK. It's interesting what you said, because we, we never hear that line. That uh, I mean, it's very confusing, the Kurdish situation. It has been for a long time, just in yeah. terms of acronyms. But one figure, Abdullah Ocalan, there stands... For PKK. Uh, uh, alone. That's, that's but, the leftist movement of the Kurdish movement, which wants to have independence even within Turkey. But Britain has always seen the uh, legitimate... 
Kurdish uh, representatives as not the PKK, but as well, you quite, say, quite, these forces that became ISIS. Well, quite frankly, Britain has moved over the years from one side to the other. They were the people who signed the Seaver Treaty, which says the Kurds will never have a state. Then they changed again in 1991, where we had the safe haven and we helped them to create a state. We have almost an embassy of the Kurdish movement here in, in, in London and other, other, other capitals. We want to support uh, the, the Kurds in Iraq, but we can't support the Kurds in Turkey because it's against the Turkish interest. So that's the complication. This is where, uh, obviously, the politicians and sometimes the media has to make this wide brush. You know, ISIS is a threat to Europe, so let's fight it. And we call everybody else there as an ISIS. But, and we, but we it would be true to say that Britain is helping the YPG, the militant wing of the PKK right now, which is a prescribed group here as terrorists well, here? Part of the help does not have to be intended to. But if you fight the enemy of those people, then you are helping But them. these are British boots on the ground training. Which Kurdish fighters? The Kurdish well, they fighters... Are, they, they are with the Iraqi government of Erbil because this is the creation we have created in Iraq. The, the occupation of Iraq created this, this situation. We helped the Kurdish movement in the north of Iraq and we are helping the central government in, in Baghdad because it's our baby, it's our creation. It's the monster we have created. So we have to continue saying it's all very good and it's democracy and all the rest of the slogans which are being used. But in fact, both of them are abusing the people there to, to varying degrees. The Baghdad is still bombing civilians in, all, over, all over Iraq. And now the Western forces, which is using air force, again is killing civilians in Iraq. The idea that somehow you can fight terrorism from the air, which we had a whole debate here in Parliament, I don't know what is the point in that one, because we have few planes in, in Cyprus, they go fly over Turkey, over Iraq, they go for three hours and come back, shooting what? Because we still do not have the definition of ISIS. If the man doesn't have the flag, is he an ISIS man or not? This is back again to the Bush doctrine of a virtual enemy war on terror, no time limit. So we don't know what is the objective. How do we know we get rid of ISIS? What, what is the point that we decide we've reached the end? Do you think of that's it? convenient that there's no time frame or some time frames have been given which are lasting decades or maybe three years? We get different times. Yeah, it, it's actually, it is convenient because there is no policy. Everybody is following the US. Everybody, whether it's Canada, you know, this idea that somehow you have 40 countries now aligned against ISIS is ludicrous. What, you know, what has got Canada and Australia, top end and southern end of the world, what, what have they got to do with, with ISIS? Terrorism knows no boundaries, but that's different. Terrorism, fighting terrorism within the country, yes, for every country must do that. But the idea that somehow we can go and fight in Iraq, but we don't fight in Syria, because constitutionally in the US, it doesn't have the right to attack Syria. It has the right to attack although in the, Iraq. Although the US they kind of is. Oh, I wanted doing. to come on to that about uh, Philip Hammond uh, the other week when he met, um, when he went to Washington, seemed to be suggesting basically Britain is just one vote away from bombing Syria. I, I don't think there is much action. If Angelic opens, maybe that you have, maybe it becomes more convenient. But so far, all the bombing in Syria has been the destruction of the refineries of Syria. And refineries are not used only by ISIS. Maybe they have benefited from it. But the people want it, the government want it, the opposition want it. The, everybody needs the fuel from these refineries. We've destroyed so far, I think, 10 refineries in Syria claiming we're fighting ISIS because we cannot fight terrorism from the air. So we go and destroy other things. ISIS is not an army. It doesn't have bases, doesn't have air force, doesn't have uh, airports, it doesn't have anything. So what, do you, what are we bombing from there? On the other hand, nobody wants to put boots on the ground. We are, even in Britain, although we've sent people, we don't say we send them, they are just trainers and the Americans are just doing training. Everybody is on holiday, the, the British army, the French army. Now the Belgians are bombing in, in Iraq. Iraq has become the area where everybody bombs there. It doesn't matter why, because the government is saying, yeah, please help us. But the government in Baghdad says, yes, it, it's okay for the Belgians to come and bomb, but we don't want the Saudis to bomb. We don't want the, the Bahraini to i.e. you select who's going to bomb your land. Well, in fact, no country that respects itself would ask another country to bomb its territories. And, indeed, and indeed, the uh, Iraqi Prime Minister uh, Abadi saying he didn't want any um, uh, Persian Gulf want, countries bombing Iraq. He said he didn't Iraq. want any Arab countries, partly because he is allowing the Iranians to bomb. Because the Iranians are bombing, he's saying, 
We don't want the Gulf people. This is as a gesture because the Americans said to the Iranians, you shouldn't be bombing them. But what a complete them. utter I mean, I can imagine dogfights in the air between them, it's, the it's Saudi Air Force yeah, and the yeah. Iranians. But can I just get on to the civilian casualties then? Very difficult. You said the refineries. Obviously, that's going to put out electricity supplies and so on. Isn't Absolutely. It? The suffering in, in Syria and in Iraq is tremendous. But because the media concentrate on the American journalist and on the British uh, social worker, people in Iraq and in Syria don't matter. They are numbers. You know, 100 here and 50 there. And, but actually, you have the suffering of the people on a variety of levels. First of all, the quality of life is so bad in Syria and in Iraq. Even without war, people are dying. You have no water, no electricity, no infrastructure, no security. You are bombing all over the place. Your governments are not in control. On top of that, you have both governments, the Syrian and the Iraqi, bombing people, uh, uh, barrels of, of explosives, uh, uh, doing everything. And then we have the Europeans and the Americans, i.e. the uh, coalition of the willing, yet again, the same one, coming again to do the, this further destruction. You have the people who have moved from Kabani and from the, the Christian area and from the Yazidi area to the mountains. Of course, they probably they were not subjected to the fight, but human beings are afraid when there is bombing well, or there is a threat. Uh, quite apart from the civilian casualties, the bigger narrative is sectarianism. This is something about sectarianism. Uh, what do you think about that being repeated again and again as we go further into this conflict? Well, certainly sectarianism has become an element, but one has to realize that Syria and Iraq, for the last thousand years, they've had no fights over, over the sectarian. But what you, the, the idea of divide and rule is not something, something new. The, the Greeks practiced it and everybody else does. You go into a country and make them fight with each other and then you say, hey, what? You know, it's not us, it's the Iraqis. Are, and because they are Shiites and Sunnis and Christians and Muslims and Yazidis and Alawis and whatever other terminology, of course, this you engender it and it begins to be that. You put a government in Baghdad which is almost sectarian. It's backed by Iran, it's a sectarian one. Iraq was called upon by the UN, by the US, by the West, everybody, they must have a, 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 an inclusive government. At the end of the day, all the faces you see now are exactly the same faces they were for the last 10 years with Maliki. Sabah al Mukta, thank you very much. Coming up after the break, do we need revolutionary new government policies to prevent a revolution in the UK? I should say at the outset that I'm speaking through a sore throat. Plus, Ed Miliband has a sore throat at this week's Prime Minister's Questions. All this and more in part two of Going Underground. Almost nothing gives the British establishment more happiness than stories about how burgeoning superpower China is somehow on the rocks. At this week's Prime Minister's Questions, here is David Cameron talking about recent protests in our former colony of Hong Kong. And I also think we should be very clear about the importance we attach to the 1984 Joint Declaration because, of course, that Joint Declaration makes very clear that the current social and economic systems in Hong Kong will remain unchanged, including the lifestyle. Unchanged from when it was a de facto British colony being run by a dictator, what does this weird lifestyle declaration talk about? And it talks about rights and freedoms, including those of person... Hold it. Person? I thought it was his government that wanted detention without trial here in Britain. There's actually a secret trial going on right now. What else is Hong Kong supposed to have that we don't have here in Britain? Of speech. Freedom of speech. Cameron said at the Tory conference that people should face up to ten years in prison for free speech. Of the press. Freedom of the press. He sent his cabinet secretary into the offices of The Guardian to smash up its computers. Of assembly. Theresa May, the Home Secretary, said people should be banned from public places at this month's conference in Birmingham. Of association. What? Theresa May actually said she would explicitly ban association with named people only a couple of weeks ago. Of travel. Well, that should set the minds of those wanting to go to fight for ISIS in Iraq and Syria at rest. Of movement. Not sure Julian Assange would agree with you on that one, Prime Minister. He's trapped without any charges on him in the Ecuadorian embassy surrounded by UK police. And indeed of strike. Freedom to strike. Most of your party wants to ban strikes here in the UK as austerity policies kick in. Well, after that bizarre litany, one of his arch enemies, Douglas Carswell, once the one to watch in the Tories and now taking his place in history as UKIP's first MP, had a question. And Carswell even referenced Tory Zach Goldsmith. 
MP for Richmond Park in it. My honourable friend, the member for Richmond Park, will be pressing amendments to ensure the recall bill makes MPs meaningfully accountable to their constituents. Real recall. Will the Prime Minister now support these amendments in order to honour the promises on which he sought office in 2010? Honouring promises? I will look very carefully at all amendments that come forward because, frankly, getting this bill together, I think we've come up with the minimum acceptable for recall, but I think there's a lot of uh, very good arguments to be had about how we can go further, and I look forward to having them in the House of Commons. Very statesmanlike, or uh, maybe the Prime Minister is the Tory MP thinking of defecting to UKIP. Anyway, what did the Leader of the Opposition have to say, given that, thanks to his policies on Iraq, we are now again at war. I should, say, I should say at the outset that I'm speaking through a sore throat. Through? Better to speak with your throat rather than through it, Mr Miliband. He still never mentioned the war, and before he made Cameron mad about criticism of the bedroom tax, the PM said this. Well, let me say to uh, the right hon. Gentleman, I'm sure the whole House will wish him to get well soon with his uh, sore throat. If he gets a doctor's appointment, we do hope he doesn't forget it, and he makes to uh, <laughs> make sure he... Um, up on time. A reference to Miliband's forgetfulness. Anyway, there is actually a war on. What is the UK government doing to try and make sure that massacre is prevented in Kobani? Well, the training of an effective Syrian national opposition, because in time the right answer for Syria is the same as the right answer for Iraq. David Cameron seems to be saying that the way to prevent an ISIS massacre in Kobani is to train ISIS fighters in Syria, and that instead of just 200,000 dead in Syria, it should be a million dead, just like in Iraq, after what looks like near-genocidal British foreign policy by Labour and the Tories for as long as anyone can remember. Occupy began their takeover of Parliament Square last night with a vigil for the eradication of poverty. Over the next 10 days, they will call for changes to a political system geared, they say, to the wealth of the few. Today, Occupy are calling for a revolution in democracy. But what changes should our politicians be implementing if Westminster wants to avoid revolution, whether violent or non-violent? With me here in the studio is Frank Ferredi, Professor of Sociology at the University of Kent. Frank, welcome to Going Underground. Occupy isn't the only thing happening this weekend. The Battle of Ideas conference in London. You're speaking. What will you be speaking about? Well, one of the things we're concerned with is that uh, public debate has really become extremely feeble and the quality of discussion of, of the issues of the day tends to be fairly narrow and technocratic. We very rarely discuss the, the big questions of our times. Particularly, we very rarely discuss questions that are to do with the future. What kind of world do we want to move into? And I think the battle of ideas provides an opportunity for people to raise some of those bigger questions and try to create a dynamic whereby more and more people feel that it is possible and, and in fact, it's their duty to uh, think, reflect, but also to speak out. So the general election is just a few months away. So uh, why, why do you think the main parties seem so confused about the key issues like uh, the NHS, child benefit, Immigration. I think politicians have uh, really switched off. They very rarely are educated in big public issues of our times. They are really driven by media trainers and uh, people who have an eye to the public relations aspect of things. And when you, whenever you hear a politician talk these days, they never say this policy is good or this policy is bad. Instead, they will say research shows or we have evidence-based policies, they kind of hide behind science and research and just about anything that avoids them being exposed to the real issues of our time. And I think when you have that kind of issue, then you will find that politicians, when they come into the elections, are merely concerned with the, just getting elected rather than about the, the meaning of their policy. So whose fault is it? Is it the Academy's fault or is it the fault of, well, I mean, when Labour were in, they, of course, introduced targets for waiting lists and ambulances and, and it was a disaster. That was scientific method applied to policy in the hospitals. So are they scared of the scientific method and is it the fault of the Academy? I, I, think, it's a, I think it's to do with the temper of our times, which uh, influences the Academy and the political class. And, I think we've seen a situation in the last three decades where, with the exhaustion of politics, with the idea of there is no alternative, politics has become pointless or purposelessness. And therefore, what you have is basically parties almost inventing issues, 
are we going to raise taxes by 2%? Are we going to you know, lower taxes by 5%? The, the debates are really about marginal issues, marginal questions. And I think until we begin to uh, understand that there is an alternative and that uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that there is an alternative, we are going to be disoriented in the way uh, the case is at the moment. There is one overarching policy issue, of course. Ed Miliband was uh, told off for forgetting about the deficit in his speech. Do you think that is the one enveloping issue as we, as we go into the general election proper? Well, I think the deficit is a symptom of something much more fundamental, which is that in uh, Europe, but, uh, but, but particularly in, in, in Britain and Italy, uh, investment in infrastructure and in industry and in economic life is nil. Productivity is very, very low. And obviously, if you're not producing more than you did beforehand, your borrowing requirements are going to increase and increase and increase. And the deficit is really a symptom of economic malaise at a more fundamental level. Yet our politicians find it very easy to reach a consensus when it comes to war. Why is that? They can have a consensus about war as long as it's very, very limited. I think that the kind of wars that governments like are, are ones where they basically sit behind computers and let the drones do the business and then just get out of there as soon as possible and kind of a, almost like a Hollywood-like dramatization of a war. And I think as long as war is really uh, a kind of uh, performance rather than getting boots on the ground and, and involving the whole nation, there, there can be consensus. But the minute you're talking about real geopolitical battles, I think you'll find that the governments and political parties are just as divided on this, these issues as all the rest. Now, how long can the politicians continue to be acting like this? Because it's, it's unprecedented for midwives to be on strike. Uh, the police were on strike recently. Uh, the big demonstrations uh, this weekend, the Occupy movement. How long can the politicians keep uh, kind of fencing themselves in in, in gated communities? <laughs> I think a fair bit of time because these kinds of protests in historical terms are really kid stuff. I, I think when you look at Occupy and you compare them to the radical demonstrations of the of previous decades, which are much more purposeful, uh, you'll find that there is no strong dynamic in, at the grassroots at the moment. What you have instead is kind of growing passivity and cynicism, skepticism. And I think the problem that we face is how you manage, how you kind of confront that cynicism and skepticism uh, and turn that into a more active, future-oriented political movement. Do you think well, it's also symptomatic of something else, that the loss of British identity in the face of uh, decline and these new emerging BRICS countries? I think certainly uh, British confidence has become uh, exhausted in, in recent decades. And I think it's interesting that whenever you talk to British people who are in, in political life or people in academic life and, and ask them, you know, what is it that makes you want to be proud to be British? Invariably, the only answer they give is the NHS. And the NHS has, has been turned into this kind of sacred monument to the world. But actually, if anybody goes to Germany or France, you'll realize much that's more expensive health systems in uh, and Germany much better. And France, I, I, I think I'd rather be ill in France and Germany than back well, home. Well, that's a big debate. The NHS. I mean, your your work has taken in ideas about um, those emerging economies and politicians yes. here not coming to terms with it. It's interesting you say that. Uh, do you think then you'd place yourself then on on the right of the spectrum on the NHS, which is the central, as you say, central topic binding everyone together? I think the right left distinctions are very uh, foolish. I think. Uh, every civilized society has to have risk sharing where we provide health provisions to everybody. I think that's our responsibility. How we manage that uh, is, has got to be a little bit more uh, sort of subtle than at the moment. Uh, my argument would be to have a greater space for uh, third sector organizations. I think charities are often much better at delivering and providing good he quality health care. Not just elastoplasts. No, but I mean, really serious kind of, uh, uh, kind of health care. And also, I think there's different ways of, of, of doing this. There's a room for maybe insurance on top of what the state provides. I think this has got to be debated because the NHS, contrary to the way it's presented in the media, it has got some very major problems. There's so many people say, if you just fund it at the same level as those countries and have the same bureaucratic structure, it will outperform everywhere. But these are the kinds of debates being done at the Battle of Ideas, exactly, presumably. Do you think at the Battle of Ideas, the uh, spectrum of views will be uh, the sort of libertarian right to liberals, or, as you said, the left-right split is no longer... Yeah, I, mean, I think 
we have everybody from the hard left to libertarian right and in between. I mean, even though these labels are often more apparent than real, but nevertheless, there will be real debates on many of these issues between people who are fundamentally opposed, particularly on the economic, social kind of questions. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, clarity will only be gained through a clash of views, which we very, very rarely get in normal public life. Professor Frank Ferreira, thank you. Thanks. The guest list from the annual Tory black and white ball has been leaked and you needed more than a glass slipper to get invited. Tickets cost up to £1,000, but that's nothing compared to what the Conservatives are getting in donations from their strategically placed table mates. The then Energy Minister Michael Fallon dined with energy tycoons. The then Housing Minister Chris Hopkins sat with property barons. And the Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan-Smith broke bread with payday lenders CLC. That's the legalized shark shoal that can, can charge up to 2,000% APR on a loan. They were slammed in 2012 for doorstepping a retired couple who had built up a debt of 65 thousand pounds. But when Ian Duncan Smith's CLC pals are not extorting from the elderly, they could be giving the impression that they're bribing the Tories not to crack down on payday lenders. Donations amounted to 28 and a half thousand pounds. And what do you know? Ian Duncan Smith excluded companies like CLC from oversight by independent statutory agencies. As far as we know, no one from Wonga was at the party, but then a major Wonga stakeholder, Adrian Beecroft, has given nearly a million to the Tories since 2006. And the Prime Minister's senior advisor, Jonathan Luff, actually quit working for Cameron to become a lobbyist for Wonga. Better money, we can only assume. There is nothing, however, connecting the PM's advisor to Wonga's multi-million pound fine for sending tens of thousands of legal letters to people from made-up law firms. CLC and Wonga didn't get back to us in time for this broadcast. Show's over, but we're back on Monday when we speak to Lord Mandelson's former advisor about whether Labour is now in bed with big business. Don't forget you can drop us a line on Twitter at underground underscore RT, like our page on Facebook, or email us on goingunderground at rttv.co.uk. See you on Monday.